joining us. Uh, the Census Bureau. office than when he arrived, and now it appears President Obama is at risk of duplicating that uh, dubious achievement. In fact, the median income is lower today than it was 15 years ago, which is something that has almost never been true uh, in American history. What, why have incomes stagnated for so long, and is there a path that you can see forward toward consistently raising them again? So, Ron, let's step back for a minute. You know, wage growth and productivity used to grow in parallel. And then in about 1973, that stopped being the case. And if you step back and say, well, why is that? It's really this reduction in investment in what we call the commons, education, infrastructure, things that can keep America competitive and keep our workforce competitive. So when we step back and think about what are we going to do about that and what is the path forward, we have to think about how do we invest in worker productivity so that our workers are globally competitive. Because what happened in 1963, or 73, was it was the beginning of globalization, mm -hmm. the beginning of when technology <coughs> advances started to really impact uh, uh, productivity. And so we have to continue. So the path forward, continue. go into detail yeah. of I, I, all I, of these. Let, but let me ask you one question. We, we, you point out that productivity has continued to grow even though wages have not. So are we talking primarily about a problem of economics, technology, globalization, or are we talking about a problem primarily of politics, the way the gains in the economy are distributed? Well, I, I, think, it's, I think it's all of the above, right? I think what we have to do is Prior, use politics to prioritize, if you will, and the prioritization is, you know, if you look at our R&D, our R&D, real R&D investment has been flat since 1980. I mean, that's not going to help us when the rest of the world and other large economies are spending more and more money, that puts us at a less competitive situation. So, you know, the path forward to me involves things like basic education, what are we teaching kids in school, how are we teaching them, what, how much, you know, what, why is connectivity so important, why is Connect Ed, the president's mm -hmm. program for uh, kids in school so they have access to broadband so important. It's so that we can stay ahead. We have to invest, frankly, in immigration. We need, we're, we have a shortage of high-skilled workers. Uh, there's an opportunity in terms of immigration reform to deal with that. But also, there's an economic opportunity and a moral op obligation when it comes to uh, skilled workforce. Uh, I mean, uh, immigration. Second is we have to invest in not just our roads and our bridges, and we've all read all the data mm. about the, you know, we're not investing enough, but we also have to invest in high-speed broadband. We have 20% of households who do not have access to high-speed broadband. How can we compete? More and more business is being done on the internet. Uh, you know, I was just at Etsy. Uh, uh, Etsy. Etsy is a um, is a company that allows someone to start a business at home and run their business on a marketplace. It's a public company. Mm. Uh, you know, it's a, a and a fast growing public company here in the United States, and it, it's basically a marketplace for craft workers to sell their things. We've got to be able to have broadband for those folks to have access to the market. 90% of which are women, most of whom are staying at home. These are micro business, you know, businesses. So there's a new definition of what business and productivity is that we're not connecting. Let me ask you about one specific element of the agenda. In January 2010, the president set the goal of doubling U.S. exports over five years. You obviously did not uh, meet that goal. Big part of the reason was the slowdown in the international economy. But I'm wondering what else you learned about trying, A, to get more U.S. companies to export, since relatively few do now, and B, trying to get those that do to expand their operations. What are the problems that we face internally on meeting a goal like that? Well, first of all, why is the goal so important? The goal is so important because we can't, we need an all of the above strategy. 96% of customers are outside the United States, whether I'm a craft worker or I'm Boeing, right? And throughout the entire spectrum. Or a superhero. 
or superheroes. Yes, which right? we've learned in Hollywood, yes. Right, exactly. But the point is, is that it's not just about our market, it's also about uh, being able to access the world's markets and the fastest growing markets. So what have I learned? We, we went out, the president, you know, I went out and spoke, have spoken with over 2,000 business leaders. What have they told us that they want? They want market access. Help us get market access. We want to be able to sell our goods where we want. We need data. We need data about a specific market and a specific sector. So what's the opportunity in India versus mm -hmm. what's the opportunity in Brazil for my particular good or services? They want less red tape. It's got the customs processes need to be easier. We want a single window. We want a single form. We want a simplified form. We want also expanded access to international financial, uh, to finance for international trade. So we at the Department of Commerce have taken all this input and what, what have we done about it? We put out a report um, for the 19 top markets around the world. What is the demand in different sectors? Um, we've also made more of our data available online so, so the average person can access it. We've created screening tools online for exporters so that they can know, you know better access exporting. We have our U.S. Export Assistance Centers, 105 centers around the United States whose job it is is within your community to help you figure out which markets your goods and services are, uh, there's a market for them and where your goods and services are competitive. Is there a new target date for reaching the doubling that the president talked about? You know, I think we, mi we miss focus on this notion of when do we hit a doubling. I think the point is American businesses today need to be born global. They need to think global because we're global, globalization and global con competitiveness is what's happening. And so what we're GE or Boeing. You know, speaking of foreign markets, the Chinese President Xi Jinping was just here in, in, in D.C. last week. When he arrived in Seattle last week, you greeted him with a speech that diplomats would describe as a full and frank uh, exchange of views. Among other things you said, here I'm quoting, we and our companies continue to have serious concerns playing field across a range of sectors and welcome right I mean that was like the next um, so how would you describe the state of our economic relations with China particularly after this visit well I think that you know let's step back China is the second largest economy in the world and they have and and this is what I said I mean you took one paragraph yes. out of what I said notable paragraph it was notable it got quoted a lot but basically any reaction you, from the president by the way as you were talking any the, uh... Our president, no, no. Our president Xi. President Xi. Uh, you know what? His his uh, 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 the group that was traveling with him. We had lots of conversation about these issues, because frankly, this is not news to yeah. them. They know it, and they keep saying they want to do reform. And w part of my message was, it's not just American companies that need the con need intellectual property protection. Your companies are telling us they're having the same problems. And so this is, and, and the big meta message for the Chinese was, look, the way you got here over the last 30 years is extraordinary. Mm -hmm. What they have accomplished, 600 million people out of poverty is amazing. And, but a lot of it was on the back of selling their goods and services around the world. Global demand today is slow. We know that. That's on exporting their goods around the world. Uh, and they need to have a stronger domestic economy, which means they need to develop a, a, a greater social safety net for their uh, people. And it also means that they need to develop things like intellectual property protection or uh, uh, courts, commercial courts of law, which they have asked us to help them with. One of the things we agreed to do is they really want serious 
help to create commercial courts of law. They created an intellectual property court because they recognize they're becoming a mature, innovative economy. They need these things. So it's, it will benefit American businesses, but they're not doing it for that reason. They're going to consider doing this or trying to do this because it's for their own benefit. One area President Obama and President Xi talked about last week was a structure to respond to allegations of cyber mm -hmm. attacks. But the president had a, a pointed comment in the news conference. He said that the question now is, are words followed by actions? So what is the time frame for you know, kind of thinking about whether this works? Leading up to this visit, significant progress was made in terms of the sectors of their economy that they're talking about opening up. Now, is there more work to do? Of course there's more work to do. That will be the story of our relationship with China throughout our lifetimes. But there was progress made. So we have to acknowledge where progress is made, and we also have to continue to work where there are challenges. Um, they say they're very committed to one of the biggest issues that I've been talking with them about over this year has been intellectual property protection. They want and need technologies from around the world. They have mm. also some of their own world-class technologies. They need this. They want to do it better. They've asked for our help. We've offered our help. Now let's see what happens. We have to give that time. Another part of the world. You're on your way to Cuba soon. Yes. What do you, by the end of this presidency, what do you expect economic relationships between the U.S. And, the Cuba, and Cuba to look like? Well, I think that we have to step back for a minute. Remember, it's, what, almost 55 years without uh, a relationship uh, with Cuba. I, I think that the first thing that we have to do, aside from what's happened, which is acknowledging that we're going to have, that we have relations now, is we have to build trust. Because to have an economic relationship. First, you have to trust each other. And, tr and so part of my trip is really a fact-finding mission and a relationship-building mission. Now, where does that lead? Part of that is very dependent upon the embargo legislation. Mm -hmm. Right now, there are at some, there's a limit to how much the president can do by executive order. Um, we're trying to do what we can because we want the Cuban want a more open relationship, we want a more open relationship with Cuba. The pace of that is going to somewhat be dependent on two factors. Cuba itself, you know, for example, their distribution systems are run entirely by the government. So they could decide how much of our goods and services they want distributed. The internet is very limited capability and access at this point. I think only uh, 2 million of 11 million people have cell phones. I mean, there's just a lot of infrastructure that needs to happen. So we have to put this in perspective. Having said that, um, I've seen since the president's announcement on December 17th significant changing of attitudes here in the United States about the prospect of doing more business with Cuba. There's a, lot, a real warming up to the idea throughout the country, and so I'm very excited about the potential. We're down to our last minute. I want to ask you about someone who you may have heard of named Donald Trump. Uh -huh. um, and Donald Trump said, has said, I'm quoting, China is killing us. Mexico is killing us. Japan is killing us. Everybody is beating us. We have incompetent people negotiating trade. We're losing money at every single step. We don't make good deals anymore. I know the smartest guys on Wall Street. I know our best negotiators, guys like Jack Wells. I mean, guys like Henry Kravis. I'd love to bring my friend Carl Icahn. I mean, we have people that are great. Would we get better trade deals with Henry Kravis and Carl Icahn negotiating them? Well, I'm friends, I, I'm friends oh, with I think all he, of them. I think, he, he, I think he promoted Carl Icahn to Treasury Secretary, by uh, the way, in the last 24 hours. Uh, so. I missed that. Yeah. But, uh, uh, um, Will we get better deals? You know what? I think... I, I think that that um, I think that that is just simplifying the situation way too much. 
you know, let's take TPP. We are literally, as we speak, our trade representative is, is working on trying to close out the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, there's a ministerial going on right now in Atlanta. Our teams are down there helping negotiate on the open, last open issues around dairy and autos uh, and, in, and uh, biologics. And it's hard. You've made a deal, you know, between two people. Hmm. Imagine trying to make a deal between 12 countries on 26 different chapters of issues. This is complicated. This is hard. And remember, it's not about just one negotiator making the difference. It's also about all those industries in all those countries having a point of view mm. about what you're agreeing to and how it's going to affect their equities. So that's what you're trying to do. And yet, at the same time, the president has set a goal of, I want a high standard agreement. We're not making just any agreement to have an agreement to check the box. We're trying, what we're trying to do in, in, with the Trans-Pacific Partnership and TTIP is create a, a set of what are the rules of the road for trade in the 21st century? What are, what are the kinds of labor standards, environmental standards, intellectual property standards? What, what about e-commerce? Are we going to have a free and open internet or not? These are all issues that have, that have not been addressed in one form or fashion in previous trade agreements. So it's a, you know, this is complicated. I think we have terrific negotiators, very tough, and uh, I'll put them up against right. whoever Donald Trump suggests. All right. Madam Secretary, thank Thanks. you for joining us.